Hey, so welcome back, everyone. Um, hey, so um, so uh, um, so today we'll talk about um, Markov um, chains, um, and so. Um, so, so on, so, so, so the lectures last week were on dealing with noise and, um, it turned out we had a guest lecture on Wednesday about privacy and, and, and I, I don't think that totally, I saw the slides, I don't think that totally got into how that relates to the noise part of data. So maybe one of the last couple lectures I might talk about some stuff with differential privacy and, and how that fits in because... Um, because, I, um, because I'm not sure Tammy got to that part, and that's also cool. So if we have space at the end of the semester, I might might talk about that a little bit. Um, but what we're starting now is kind of the last section of class, and so this this so we're going to talk about Markov chains, which is a a um, kind of an object which at first is not going to seem related to the rest of the section. Um, but in general, we're going to be talking about kind of understanding um, um, so, so under, understanding social networks and trying to do mining on graphs, right? So social networks you can often think of as 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 these graphs, and this is a way of modeling them. So again, if you think of like um, kind of the simplest way of modeling it like this is you think of um, of if you have all the data. On, on Facebook, one thing that they store is, you know, so I asked, I think I asked on last week who is on social networks, and Facebook was one thing that like at least 10% of the class was, was on, although you guys don't use Twitter or any of the other stuff. But, but on, so on, on Facebook, there's like, there's you, and then you have all these, you know, um, you know, you have a friend, Joe, you know, so this is if if you guys are friends with each other, then there's kind of an edge, right? And then there's um, Bill, you know, and, and if you're also friends with Bill, then there's an edge. And if Joe and Bill are friends, then there's then there's an edge between them. But if they're not friends, then there's not an edge, right? And you can think of all of Facebook's data as a big graph like this. And how you choose to make these edges here? Well, maybe you don't just want to say friend or no friend, maybe it's directed or friend one way but not the other way. Maybe it's you've, they've just done something that's a weaker relationship than a friend. They've, they've shared stuff in, 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 in some way. Um, so, and so you can put scores on these in, in various ways. But in the simplest way, you kind of, you can take this data in this social network and you can build this graph based on these interactions. Okay, so, and so, these large social networks have these these kind of these beasts, these huge data sets, which have arisen in the last, you know, only like 10 or 15 years. And so even in like the dot-com boom, which was in the late 1990s, right? So, so if you remember this, all this stuff like, um, there's all this stuff like pets.com, right? So, so, so does anyone remember like this stuff from dot-com boom and stuff? So that all, all of these, a lot of these websites, even back then, um, like I knew of, there's this one where you could, you could surf the web, and I was in college at the time, and so you could uh, surf the web, web will have an advertisement on the bottom. I was by a website, and they would pay you to surf the web with this ad on the bottom. Right? And, and so I actually knew some of the people who were working at this company, and their goal was you know, they would pay you and, and, and it seemed like, okay, I had a friend who bought a computer by, by doing this, right? But their goal was to build a social network, to understand interaction between people. So for like 20 or 30 years, people knew that or kind of thought that there was money to be made or to understand the relationships between people. So we're really getting this big data as, as a graph um, and understanding these relationships, and how you store those if it's just an edge or it's modeled differently by some sort of notion of similarity between people and some based on the interactions, you can build other models, right? But so once we have this graph, you know, what we've talked about so far, we've, we've talked about how to do um, spectral clustering. And so this was 
back in like the lecture 11 or something on the clustering section. Um, but there's, there's a few other things that are useful to do in these, in these large graphs. And so um, one of the kind of things that we're going to talk through and we're going to develop this over four lectures um, is, is going to be um, how does um, this algorithm called page rank work? So, so, um, so who's heard of page rank? Who's not heard of page rank? Okay, okay. So, so th this was so, um, <clears throat> so. So, page rank, kind of briefly, is kind of the the algorithm that makes Google's search engine work well, and it's using another graph structure, and that's the graph structure of the web. So, all the web pages out there are thinking of these nodes, and the edges. You can think of it as these links between the nodes, or maybe other sorts of relationships between these pages. And so PageRank looks at this web graph and finds interesting structure about it. And this kind of revolutionized how searching worked on the web. And built Google, it's an interesting story. So, so the, the lecture on Wednesday is basically just me telling the story of how PageRank was developed. Okay, um, so so so, so we've talked about spectral clustering. We'll talk about PageRank. In order to talk about PageRank and understand why it works, we're going to start off by talking about these Markov chains. Markov chains provide the kind of underlying kind of uh, math of what's going on underneath. And they're not just useful for PageRank. They're a really cool object. And I've, there are a few of the class projects that are trying to model things as Markov chains to do something. And it's kind of, you know, the, the, if, I know, like, actually some of you are, are actually math students and take math class and you're used to kind of this, they have this, all these formalities and definitions and you're, and if you're not a math student, you're like, why do they need these formalities and definitions? In Markov chains, they're kind of these series of properties that you need, but once you get those properties, these, these kind of magical kind of analysis works out. And if you don't have them, weird things happen and it breaks down. And this is to understand why PageRank works, you're going to need to work through these properties of Markov chains. And they're going to be useful for other sorts of modeling um, approaches as well. Um, so so we'll, we'll talk about those today. We'll also have a couple lectures on scalability. Because these graphs are really large. You know, there are now, I think, like, um, apparently over a billion users on Facebook. Right, so uh, when you have billion users and a lot of edges, um, the ed turns out the number of edges people thought would probably scale in a way that was linear with the number of users. Turns out, but it's probably not true. It probably grows super linearly. So it's probably the number of edges um, is probably something like equals to the number of of vertices to some power of 1 plus epsilon, where epsilon is maybe between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. So there's been some studies of large graphs and kind of tried to look at, as they've grown, what this constant is. But it's growing super linearly. So that means that the average number of edges per vertex is growing with the size of the graph. So if you have a billion here, if this term is a billion and you raise it to some power, it's going to be much more than a billion, right? So these, these, this data set is huge. We need to understand how to operate these things. So, you know, the, the, the web graph is also, you know, roughly on the scale, depending on how you count it. So to do page rank, you're also going to need to understand the scalability. And this brings us to another kind of, um, kind of hot, kind of buzzword that's maybe has been kind of dying out. Um, so, but there's this general framework uh, um, that's, um, that's called MapReduce. And so this has kind of been taken over by an open source version that's, uh, um, um, that's called Hadoop. And then this has kind of been evolved in various ways. And we'll talk a little bit about this evolution. But there's a lot of really cool ideas that went into MapReduce and kind of the structure that built it. And this is really important for scaling a lot of data sets, or for, for a lot of data sets. Not just exactly how MapReduce works, which I'll explain so you kind of understand so you can 
use it if you if you need to. But in understanding scalability in in general in these really in, in these in these really large data sets. So we'll talk about how MapReduce works, and then we'll say how do you compute PageRank using MapReduce, and that'll be kind of a a non-trivial example of, of using it. And this was one of the reasons why this was invented is that Google needed to run PageRank on really large algorithms, on, on really large data sets. Um, okay, so this will be kind of the story over the next four lectures, and then we'll talk about a couple of other things on graph based on finding communities and sparsifying them and so forth. Um, but so this is the sequence, and it's all going to start with Markov chains. And so this lecture is going to be you know, I'll talk about an algorithm, the Metropolis algorithm, at the end. So we'll have, as with the end of the time, we'll talk about an algorithm you can get out of this, um, Metropolis, um, which is going to be un fairly unrelated to PageRank, actually. It's a completely different way of using these, these, these Markov chains. Um, but the first part is going to basically just definitions. What are Markov chains and what situations can you use them in? Um, um, so, so before we start, I want to kind of, you know, we've already done a lot before we started, <laughs> but bef even, even, even adding more kind of uh, build up to what's going on there. Um, I mean, there's kind of, I like to think of there are three lessons from, from, from Markov chains. And we'll kind of see these, and these are kind of, I don't know. Um, so, you know, maybe don't take them too seriously, but they're they aren't bad to take seriously either. So, um, so, so, so um, the first one is um, only look um, forward. Um, your um, um, so so your current um, position. Is all that um, is all that matters, um, not uh, um, your past. Okay. So when you're trying to understand something, you know, when you're looking forward, only think about where you currently are. Don't worry about how you got here. You can only, you know, move on from where you are now. And so if you're familiar with with Markov, this is. This is why they're called Markov chains, and we'll we'll see this in more detail. Um, so so um, so so next one, lesson two is only take um, one step at a time. Uh, um, you will um, get there um, eventually. Um, or you won't. <laughs> so, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll actually understand when you will get there eventually, and and um, and when you won't get there. But you know, you only need to take one step at a time to do this, and that's kind of going to be the beauty of this. And that you can think of these Markov chains in these discrete steps, but they'll eventually tell you exactly where you're going, and you won't need to know how you got there. You only care about where you are. And you can do this just one step at a time. Okay. Um, and then the third lesson is that um, um, in the limit, um, everyone has um, perfect, um, so everyone has perfect karma. Right, so karma is, you know, if you do a good deed, someone else will do a good deed back, or something like that. If you're, if you're a mean person, other people will treat you mean. It's kind of the notion of karma. So, and and this is true within these Markov chains as well, and we'll and we'll see this. So, if you set yourself up properly, then in the limit, you'll have this perfect karma, where for everything you give, you'll get something back. Okay, so, and you know, the, these are reasonable lessons to, you know. Um, you know, to also um, to live your life by as well. So, um, you know, it's up to your own whether you feel that way, but they seem pretty reasonable things to say for me. Okay, great. N now that you're sufficiently confused, let's actually start the lecture. Um, okay, and so there's a lot of kind of a setup in this. So I made 
some some slides. So let me to kind of. So the first thing is that we want to. So again, this is working on graphs, and and to start this out, I want to. Okay, my mouse is working. Okay, so, um, so. So, so just to review graphs again. Um, here we are. So it's it's useful to think of these graphs again. You can think of this as this picture is how you typically see them, although the pictures don't at all scale to really large graphs. Um, and what you often get is these vertices and these edges. And for this for this kind of the context, we'll just think about these these undirected edges. But actually, the Markov chains goes through all the theory goes through for directed edges as well. But if you have these these undirected edges, you can write this as this matrix, right? Where it's this saying A has an edge going to B, and then you can start with this table, but it's actually this matrix form that we're going to do. And so here, this matrix we call G. But in general. What, what we want to do is convert this, this Markov chain, into this other matrix called P. And so this is going to be a probability transition matrix. Okay, so how did I go back and forth between these? So, so let me, um, so this, this step, so I started with kind of it's all zeros and ones. There's a one if there's an edge, a zero if there's not. What I've done is I've normalized all of the, all of the columns. Okay, so basically what this Markov chain is going to be talking about is you're going to think about you're on this graph. So let me draw a little picture here. All right, so I'm, so I'm on this graph and I'm starting, say, I'm starting at this position B. And I'm going to say I'm going to randomly walk around this graph. If I randomly walk, I'm going to say, I'm going to look at all the edges of B, and I'm going to go to one of them at random. And that's what's going on here. This is the column for B, right? And uh, half the time, I'm going to go to A, and half the time, I'm going to go to D. D is down here. Right? And so this, every column corresponds with one of these vertices, right? So this is um, A, B, C, D, E. So this is vertex E. I could go to C. G or F, and I go to C, G or F, each of them with one third probability. <coughs> right, and so if I, yep. How is it normalized? So I took every column, which was all zeros and ones, and I had it so that this, the sum of all the entries is, is one, and all of the entries are greater or equal than zero. Right, so, so you could think of it now as a probability distribution. Right, so it's a probability transition matrix is what it's called. Mm -hmm. Because this, every one of these columns is now a, um, pr a probability um, um, distribution. Um, okay. So, and the, it's a probability distribution of if you are in the state represented by this column, where do you go next? Okay, so that's what this probability transition matrix is telling you. And if I give you if I give you a graph, you can convert it into this by normalizing. So how would you convert? So you know if 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 you were to actually do the the algebra, you got a matrix which is all zeros and ones. How do you convert it into a graph that looks a table a matrix that looks like this? Yeah, right. So you sum up each column. So if, if I if I go up one slide, it's gonna my okay my uh, let's do this right if 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 I go up here um, and I, if 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 I look at this column and they're off now right this this third column had three ones here and so the sum was one and was three so I divide them all by three and now I got all um, one thirds here right so so it's it's so, and if I had things other than zeros and ones, but it was between zero and one, I could normalize them the same way. Right? So, so that would also allow me to normalize it. And the idea is so there's a probability distribution in each column, and that tells you where to move. So it's telling you this random walk. 
right? So if you take like these discrete structure classes, right, you t learn about these finite automata and stuff. And this is kind of similar in this case, except you're not looking at input to do this, you're just randomly walking around. Okay, uh, so, so let's go back to here, right? So, so, um, so a um, Markov chain, um, Um, is the input to it is going to be three objects, so V, P, and and Q. Okay, so so V is going to be the vertices. So th these are the vertices of your graph. P is is the um, probability um, transition um, matrix. Okay. So it, and so if you had a graph, you can normalize all the, the edge counts on every vertex, and you can, you can get this matrix P. So if you have the vertices and the edges, you can get from V and E to V and P. All right? So um, and then Q is going to be the initial state. Okay? Now our goal is to analyze just this graph, right? So if we have a graph, I said, so if you have the if if you have a graph G, this, so if I have a graph G equals V and edges, well then if I if I want to go to the Markov um, chain, then this V essentially goes down to the the V here. Those are the same. This P matrix I can drive from V and E. Right, I can I can normalize the the edges of every vertex, but then this Q matrix, this is an initial state. I can't get this from the input graph. So the key thing is we want to somehow analyze it in a way so this initial state's not going to matter. So in the most general setting, it's going to matter, but we want to kind of consider only cases where we don't need to know this Q. And so the, some of the formalisms I'm going to go through is going to so we can ignore this Q. Okay, so, but now what's, what's happening, so in this Q, okay, th this initial state Q is going to be some, some, some probability distribution over states. So this is, again, a pr probability uh, um, distribution over um, V, right? So, so an, an example of this, Couple of examples would be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, you know, uh, like all these are zeros except for a 1 in this case, right? So, and this would be Q transpose. So typically it's going to be a column vector. Um, and we'll, and we'll, we'll see why the difference matters in, in a, in a soon. Um, so this is one example. It's so a probability distribution that says with probability 1, I'm at state B. That's what, that's what this is saying. This is a valid probability distribution. All the entries are zero or greater, and they all and they all um, are adding up to one. But you could also say something where, say, 0 0.1 or 0, 0.0 for this one, 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0, 0, 0, 0.6, 0, 0, right? So something like this, where now it's distributed over some states. So there's 10%, this is 10%, I'm in state B, 30%, um, I'm in state C, 0% E or D, 0% E, and then 60%, I'm in F, right? So I have a probability distribution over the states, and it happens to be sparse in this case, just because it's easier for me to make sure the math worked out, right? But it could be a, it could be a dense probability distribution. This could be initial state. Sometimes... Sometimes, in some settings, you're only allowed to think of this case, where all the probability is centered at one state. Other times, you're allowed to think of the case where it's spread out. Okay, there, there are going to be two general use cases of Markov chains, and some cases only use this one. Other ones more generally use this case, and we'll, we'll see them. Um, so the general definition involves kind of any probability distribution over states, and that's your initial state. Okay? So this is kind of what it is now. What does it mean to be a Markov chain? Okay, so the idea is you start at this state, 
and I'm thinking I'm doing a random walk on my graph, right? So I'm doing this random walk around this graph here, right? And I want to say, if I this is a random process, so I want to say where where am I going to be after three steps, right? That's the sort of thing I want to understand. Well, I don't know exactly where I'm going to be. All I'm going to know is some distribution of where I'm going to be. Even if I start at B, I'm not going to be always at a single location afterwards. I, I could be, I could have a distribution. Like after one step, half the time I'm at A and half the time I'm at D. After two steps, well then it's a different probability distribution. So how do we get those things? So it turns out that using this, this probability transition matrix and this initial state, what you can say is that Q0, so after zero steps, my probability distribution where I am is at this initial state. After one step, I'm going to have a probability distribution Q1, and this is going to be this matrix P times Q. So I can take this input, input state Q, multiply it by my matrix P, and I'm going to get this initial state. If I do it again, QT, uh, Q2, um, so what is the answer going to be for this? What is, how do I get Q2 out of this? What? Yeah, so one answer is P times Q1. Right, but if you look at this, there's, there's another way I can write this down. It's P times P times Q. Right? I can expand out the definition of Q1 and I can get back this. right? And, and then Q3 is going to be, so after, and this is where the question asks, where I am after three, three steps. The distribution is P times Q2, which is equal to P times P times P times Q. And you can write this as P to the power 3 Q. So if the if it's a, this, you know, this only makes sense if it's a square matrix, which it is. You can keep multiplying it by itself. And so if I can pre-process this power, I can take this matrix to a power 3. That means I'm multiplying the matrix by itself three times, right? But So you can do that with linear algebra, and that all works. Um, and that gives me after three steps. And in general, you can say Qn equals Pqn minus 1, or that's not as meaningful, essentially, as Pn times Q. Okay, and so the goal is going to be to understand this Qn, what's going on here. Okay, so, so we'll get to this, essentially. But this Qn, after for n being very big, is going to be interesting. Let's say, after we did this random walk for a while, where are we going to be? Okay, and so if you just think about this, if you look at, if you look at this graph here, you say, well... Where am I going to be after, after two or three steps? Well, it's not, you know, if I, do, if I walk around an, enough, it might be uniform, right? I could equally likely be at every single state. Now, that could be the case, but it turns out that's not going to be the case in general. In general, you're going to have a different probability of being in these different states, and that's kind of going to tell you something interesting about the graph. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll come back to this and see this a bit more. Question? Um, the P-matrix, all the elements uh, are they between 0 and 1? Yeah, right. They're between 0 and 1 inclusive. So if you take n yeah. rows to 10,000 or infinity, uh, it's going to diminish. All these values are going to approach 0. So is there an underlying steady state? Yeah, right. So, so, so that's, so if, if you look at, so instead of just this P-matrix, you're talking about what's more interesting is this P to the N-matrix as, as N. So this... So look at, say, um, limit as n goes to infinity, p to the n. Right? You're saying you want these to all go to 0. It turns out they're not all going to go to 0. This is going to be a really interesting object. Okay? So, and, and it's, but in some cases, they are, they, they are going to kind of get weird. Right? Um, but in, in nice cases, which, we, we're, which we're going to want, so I need to explain those, it's going to have really nice properties. So in, in general, weird things could happen, but in general, um, in, in under the setting where things are called um, ergodic, and I'll explain this, then this will have really nice properties. Okay, okay. Um, let's look at, so let me just sh show you what um, this looks like a bit. So 
So if you're doing this, so, so this was again, if I use this Q as this initial state where I was always at B, after one step I'm half at A, half at D. After two steps, I'm one-sixth the time at A, two-sixths the time at B, two-sixths at C, and one-sixth at D. After three steps, it's going to look like this. So this is, was the answer. A third the time I'm at A, one-ninth at B, a ninth at C, a third at D, and one-ninth at E. All right, so, you know, it's, maybe it's not obvious how you would get this for three, or maybe if you're doing it for seven, that's even less obvious. Turns out you just use this Markov chain by multiplying by this probably transition matrix seven times, and you get this answer. So and then this is the case in the limit. Okay. All right, so let's look at these um, back here again. Okay, so, um, so, 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 so one more point of here is that if you look at this process, What you see here is that to understand state, because of this property right, right here, Qn is P times Qn minus 1, means to know the nth state, I really only need to know the previous state. Right? I've, I don't care how I got to Qn minus 1. To know Qn, I only need to know the current state. Right? So that means I'm only looking at the current state, not at how I got there. And so this process of only looking at your current state and not the history of a process is referred to as a Markov process. And, I, you know, I've, I don't have written down or I forget the meaning, but this dates back to uh, Andre Markov. And you see Markov uh, random fields and these, these other um, Markov processes. And it's talking about this property where you're only looking at the current state and you, that's all you need to go for. You don't care about how you got there. And so this is kind of why, in order to calculate these probabilities, we can only look at this, you know, to understand Q3, if we knew Q2, then we can get there in one step. Right? And this was kind of associated with this first lesson one, that you only need to care about where you are to figure out the future. Right? You don't care how you got there. Is that why there's so many things called Markov something or hidden Markov models? Yeah, it's, it's all referring to this property, this Markovian property, that you're only keeping track of the current state, not the what led up to that, right? I, to get Q3, I only need to care about Q2, right? I can ignore all this other stuff up here to get, understand Q3, right? So I guess I can do this, right? So so I so so it's nice you can forget everything that happened, and so this actually makes for certain algorithms very efficient because you don't need to keep track of the past in order to do this, and you'll get you'll get answers out of this. And you only have to care about whatever a current state at a time. And this makes it much easier than maintaining all the history, which seems like it might be necessary for some sort of uh, things you'd want to do. And, and, and we'll get to that. But in Metropolis algorithm, we'll see that's a really cool property of it. OK. Um, let's see. All right. Yeah, OK. So, so at this point, I want to say there are these two, these two types of Markov chains. And so often when people have seen, so, so I, I'm guessing, so how many people had heard of Markov chains before this lecture? And for how many people is this kind of new? So, okay, so most of the people who've, who've seen this before, I'm guessing you've probably only seen one of the two types. That's usually what happens. I'm, I'm sure some of you have seen both, but most people have only seen one of these two types and they, they think, okay, that's all there is to Markov chains. And this can cause a lot of confusion when you see something using the other type. Um, the first one is is modeling a a random um, walk. Okay, so that means explicitly I'm um, I'm just keeping the the state um, of of the walker. So that means that every QI essentially in this case is going to look like 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, right? So I'm going to have a 1 and all zeros elsewhere. Every state looks like this. Okay, so I'm only keeping the state of the walker, whereas the other model is going to say it's, it's going to model the 
distribution of these random walks. Okay, um, and, and so th this has the the state is a dense um, um, probability dist distribution. Right, so for this instance, QI is going to be something like, like 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.11, you know, and, and, and so on. It's not going to be all zeros in a single one. Right, so in the example we did before, I went through and, and, I, and I, you know, Q3 look, was looking like this. It was dense. Right, but you could think of, well, maybe I was, but really, if you're a random walk, you're only ever in one single location. Right, so if you're doing like these, uh, um, um, like these discrete finite automata or something, you're thinking, I'm only in one state at a time, and I can have a random process so, so, th so this one has a um, is is kind of a random um, process. This one is deterministic, right? So, so this one I'm keeping track of this probability state, and there's no randomness in doing this. This one is is exp is making those random choices as I'm walking along. Every time I'm at a node, I decide. I'm going to flip a coin, I'm going to go this way or that way. And I only go in one of these positions. Right? So, so think of, I mean, this is like a quantum version. Like, I don't know where I really am. Um, but once I know, then I, my state looks like this. Right? So, um, okay, so, so it turns out that um, the, this one will correspond with the, um, with the Metropolis algorithm. And this one will correspond with um, this one will correspond with page rank. So the distribution will correspond with page rank. Metropolis algorithm will correspond where you're keeping track of this this random walk. Okay, so they're really doing the same thing, right? This one is is you're modeling a random walker. This is I'm modeling the distribution of these random walkers. Which one do I want to do? Um, this technique also comes up a lot. Um, and this is a little bit more general than Metropolis algorithm, but in in like Bayesian statistics, if you ever see like Bayesian statistics, we, you know, it's a, it's a really big area and we don't talk about it a lot in this class. But what they do is they they kind of build these models, but there's no really good way to calculate these probability distribution models. So what they do is they'll run a random walk um, in order to kind of estimate these. And for the core algorithm in most of Bayesian statistics is this sort of, of Markov chain, where page rank is, is this, and it's doing something very different. Okay. Um, okay, great. So no, it's good to keep that in mind. All right, so, 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 now, so now we need to talk about what are these definitions that make this work. So if I just start out with a general Markov chain, I'm not going to always get nice understandable properties, these limiting properties. But I need it to have this, this property that's called um, the Markov chain to be, um, if the Markov chain is um, uh, um, what's called ergodic, then it's going to have these nice properties. And so if I, if I just, uh, so there, I'll define this kind of uh, directly, and then I'll, but it's easier to understand what properties it can't have. So a Markov chain is um, ergodic if um, if there exists kind of a time step t such that um, for all n greater or equal than t um, the um, all the entries in P to the N are um, strictly greater um, th um, than zero. Okay? So, so let's kind of th think about this in, in more kind of in, 
kind of in these other words. It's saying if I'm doing this random walk and after some time point t, so say this is after like 10 steps or 1,000 steps, then for every other step n, I say that this pn matrix is dense. There are no zero entries. So what that means is that for if, for, if I start in, this says nothing about the initial state q. That means for any, this says that um, for any state q that um, pnq is, is dense. That means it's all um, or is all non-zero. So no matter where I start, no matter where I start after, for any n after t steps, I have some probability of being anywhere. I could be anywhere after, after these n steps. So it's not for some, so at state t, maybe I get dense. It's dense, but they, there are these weird things where you can, you can go like a thousand steps and you get to a case where you could be anywhere, but then on the thousand and first step, there are things where you can't be again. There are some states where you can't exist again. And this does not count. Right? These, 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 you know, there are these weird cases that can happen. So you need kind of this fairly careful definition. It has to be for all values of n greater or equal than t, all entries in p to the n are greater than 0. All right? so, so, so this is the property that we need. And, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you that once you have this property, some really nice comes out of these Markov chains in the limit, which tell you a lot about the graphs. Okay? Um, so but this is a little bit hard to understand. How do I know if my Markov chain satisfies this property? Right? Question. Is this basically saying that after enough time you can be anywhere in the graph? Yeah, right. So it's, it, it's basically saying that. It's a little more careful than that. Um, it's saying, so the question is, after enough time, could you be anywhere? And that's true. That, that would be saying if there exists some t, then p to the t could be greater than zero. But it's saying it, after enough time, in every, every step from there on, I could be anywhere. Right? It's a little bit stronger. You could always be anywhere. Yeah, and, and I'll show you some examples where, 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 it's, where you can get one but not the other. You can never get stuck. Yeah, so there are a couple ways you can get, there are three ways you can kind of get stuck. And, that, and there are only three ways you can get stuck. Right? So the easier way to understand this is to understand three other properties which you can't have. So, so it has to be, so uh, the easy way to understand that the graph can be, um, has to be not what's called cyclic. So I can't have cycles in the graph. Okay, I'll show some examples of this in a second. Um, it has, so the, the, this basically means that I can't, um, <clears throat> so th th there's some types of graphs where if you have a state qi, then it has to be that, um, so if it's cyclic with, with, uh, with the cycle of length 3, then it's going to be qi um, plus 3. So qi equals qi plus 3 equals qi plus 6, right? So if qi equals qi plus 3, then every, if I add 3 to that, it's always going to be the same again, right? If I have this first case, it implies the second equality as well. So this is cyclic with the, with the factor 3. You can get cyclic with the factor 2 is kind of more common. If you have a cycle, it's going to give you a cycle. It's going to give you a, a that's where cyclic comes from. Um, but this, the, this cycle will give you things with, uh, um, depending on the length of the cycle. Um, so the, the other property is going to be, you can get these, um, so, so you want to have no um, absorbing, or um, transient states. <clears throat> okay, and what these are are kind of if you're looking at these like if you're looking at like at these finite automata, these are states that kind of say, well, if I get here, I'm going to stay in the state forever. Like I get stuck. Like if you get in an infinite loop, if the program exits, something like that. So these these absorbing states are things where once you get there, you never go anyplace else. Right? And you don't want to have these. And the transient states are everything else that aren't absorbing, if you have absorbing states. 
Okay, and I'll show some examples of these in a second. And then the third type is going to be if it's um, um, not, um, well, it, you need the graph to be connected. Um, so this would just be if there, there are two parts of the graph where you can't get from node A to node D. There's no way to get from one to the other. Right, so this, this should kind of be obvious, but you, but you need to stay, say this as well. All right, so, so let's look at some examples of these. Um, all right, so, so so some cyclic examples look like this, where, oh, shoot, if I do this, I don't my pen. Um, right, so some cyclic examples... Um, yeah, so here are my cyclic examples. So this first one, let me draw some pictures of these. This is a graph that just looks like this. A always goes to B, and B always goes back to A. Right, so if I start with some probability I'm in A, then the next round that's transferred to B and vice versa. Right, you can also have with three states. And so notice these graphs are not... Um, are not symmetric, so my edges now are directed, um, and 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 uh, you know and um, and that's okay, All right? So th this graph here, I believe, is actually you could think of as undirected, but when you norm, no, it's not un, it's not undirected, but uh, um, right. So so this graph looks like you have a. And then you have B, C, D, um, B, C, D, and E, um, and then F. And so these guys go like this, right? So I can be either in one of these these four states in the middle, or one of the two states on the edge, right? But this is cyclic because on the even steps I'm on one of these corner ones, and on the odd steps I'm in the middle. Right, so there's a cycle of degree two. In fact, there are many degree two cycles. If you have a graph that has a degree two cycle and a degree three cycle, like if I go and I add an extra edge here, so now I have a degree two cycle and a degree three cycle, this is no longer cyclic actually. Because then I can get, after enough states, I'm, I don't always have to go around in this order. I can go here, then this way, then this way, then this way. So I can kind of fill this out. So all the cycles need to be of the same order for it to work. And this has a bunch of degree two cycles in it. Okay, so these cyclic graphs, you can't have these in order for it to be ergodic. Yeah? Like in, in some definitions of cyclic, isn't that still a cyclic in graph theory? Is there a different cyclic? Yeah, so, you know, you can define it in a, in, in a way that's different. Yeah, that's, uh, this is that the probability transition matrix is being cyclic. And in that case, it's not cyclic in this case. So you can have cycles in the graph. The, that's okay. But you, you need to be able to kind of, they can't, you can't have only cycles of the same length everywhere. That's what you can't have. Okay, so so you can understand this, these cycles. Okay, so let's go on to the next example here. Um, so these absorbing and transient states, what do, what do these look like? Um, so, so this one is where you have a matrix A and it has uh, A and B, and A can go back to itself or it can go to B, and B always st stays with itself, right? So A can stay with itself, but sometimes goes to B, and then once it gets to B, it sticks in B. It never leaves, right? So this one... B is absorbing, this is B, and A is transient. So if I have some probability of being an A, it looks like at any point in the future, I'm going to have some probability of being an A. Because there's always some part that's in here, but there's a half-life to it, right? Every time it's decreasing, it's going to zero. We're going to care about what happens in the limit. And so in the limit, this is going to be zero. Even though for any finite number of steps, it's going to be finite. But eventually, 
what we care about is all the mass, all the probability is going to end up in B and then never leaves. So it's, it's like the Hotel California, right? Um, although people do move back to Utah. Um, so that's not entirely true. Um, so, and, and then the, this one is, uh, is, let's see what this one is. This is A. A goes to B. And then B um, always goes to itself. And then there's C, and let's see. So C always goes, oh, no, always goes to A. Always goes to B, right? So both A and C both point to B, and B stays with itself, right? So this one immediately, any probability being A or C always goes to, no, I didn't draw that right. Let me try this one again. <laughs> All right, it's good to, okay, so. This is A, A goes to B, B goes back to A, right? And then C, C always goes to B, right? So now A and B are going to be absorbing, even though it's not always a self-loop to itself. They can go back and forth between each other, but anything in C is lost. Once it leaves C, it gets in this A-B mess, and then it's, after that it never gets out. Okay, and then this one here is a bit more complicated. Let's see this. Um, this is A. A always sometimes goes to B and sometimes stays with itself. B usually goes back to A half the time. This is one half. Another half the time, well, 49 out of 100, so a little bit less than half the time, it stays back to itself. And one out of 100, it's going to C. And then C is part of this other group over here where they just share everything, right? So, so these guys are all going, going back and forth. So if you start with probability in A or B, most of the time it's going back and forth in this part of the graph, but it's slowly leaking out. It can slowly leak out into C. And once it leaks out, it never goes back, right? So this, again, is absorbing, and these are transient. If you have something like this, then this is also kind of bad. Okay, so, so you don't want these sort of cases. All right, and then um, any questions on absorbing and transient? All right. Um, and so th these are going to be really interesting when we talk about page rank, because... The initial idea for page rank, the, the, the basic way of doing it, kind of, it seems to work except that then there are these, these bad guys that can create states that look like this and they can kind of uh, um, absorb all this, all this web traffic. Um, all right, so and then, let's see, the last example are these things which aren't connected. All right, so these are simple. A stays with A and B stays with B or you can have A goes to B B goes back to A and then C is is with itself or it's going to be more complicated this is going to have A and B here C D and E are going to have some relationship C can go to itself to D or to E, E can go to itself, and D always goes to one of these two ways. And then you also have F that's off going to itself, right? So you have three components here, right? So, so these cases also are, are not, you know, qualified to be organic. Okay, so, so in, instead of, so you don't have to kind of, this is conceptually what you need, that this, this technical definition, but it's equivalent to just say, it can't be cyclic, has no absorbing or transient states, and it has to be connected. If it satisfies these three properties, you're going to get this blue property. Now, it doesn't tell you this value of T that you need here. Right? And this T is not, there's other kind of time points where it becomes interesting. Um, it's not telling you anything about those time points. That's kind of another, that's another story. Um, but it's saying that it's going to have, there go, there's going to exist some T where this happens. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, um, 
what's next? Okay, so now if we are ergodic, so um, now I can finally tell you the cool stuff about this. Um, is ergodic, okay? Um, when it is ergodic, then what we want to look at is the limit as n goes to infinity of p to the n times q, right? This is what we want to understand. We want to understand what happens here. All right, so it's going to turn out that so you're going to get two things. So one, um, this is going to equal um, uh, some state called Q star. Okay. You can also think of another object, P star, which is the limit n to infinity of p to the n. So this is just the matrix. Okay, so this matrix. And it turns out um, for, um, for all q that q star is equal to p star q. Right, so this is really cool. It's saying um, this is for any um, initial state Q, I'm, it must um, converge to Q star, right? For any initial state, it must converge to Q star. So it doesn't matter where I started anymore. So I needed all these, all these properties to be ergodic for this to be true, right? So if the graph was not connected, some mass would never get to Q star. This wouldn't happen. If it was cyclic, it's not going to converge. It can oscillate between two or more states. So you're not going to get quite this behavior. Um, and so it, that means that the initial state tells you a lot. That influence a lot what's happening here. And with the transient, there's some weird properties. I guess I should draw a picture like this. But let's say there's um, some, some A here. It can go to B, which is a self-loop. Okay down to this node, or it can go to C, which is also a self-loop, right? And so, so maybe actually um, there's another node, D here. So A and B can go back and forth between each other. Sometimes D goes to C, sometimes it goes, um, D always goes to C or A, A always goes to C or B, right? So depending on the initial distribution between A and D, it's going to wind up with a different distribution between B and C, right? And so if, and if depending on what I start between B and C, that stuff's never leaving. That's, that's kind of predictable. But if you have some complex initial state or more graph up here and it's some absorbing nodes down here, it really depends on a complex manner on where it starts. So these transient and absorbing things can kind of screw things up as well, right? So, so what you, that's why you kind of need all these properties. But it means that you get this, you get this kind of, um, kind of um, this, <laughs> this converge to state, right? Um, so, and this, this property is that this corresponds with L2. You know, if you keep working one step at, at a time, maybe you should think of like the homeworks like this. Um, you're eventually going to get to where you're going to get. Um, hopefully, that's the right answer. Um, you know, um, if not, maybe you need more steps, or maybe I designed it. If I designed the homework wrong, then it's going to have transient and absorbing states, um, and you'll um, hopefully, hopefully, there's only one. It's uh, the homework is going to be it, it's going to be ergodic. If you work long enough, you're only going to get to the right answer. But, so, yeah. what's the interpretation of the final Q? Of the great, great. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe that in a second. Let me give another, um, yeah, so, so, so Q, yeah, so, so let me, there's a few ways to interpret this, right? So, so this is, um, so one definition is if you do a um, random walk, um, um, and you do this forever, right? You're, you're lost in a shopping mall on, until the end of time. Or, and maybe it's time doesn't even end, right? 
So you're, you're in some sort of eternity where you're walking around randomly in a shopping mall. You're, where your expected state is going to be. Th then random walk forever, then this is the expected um, state. So it's the expected state of a random walker. Right? So, it's, so, so that's... And so this is true with either interpretation, right? Either you're in exactly one state at a time, and then you want to know where you expect to be. I know I'm only going to be in one spot, so, so, but I, I want to get one estimate of that. Or I'm just trying to calculate this distribution, and then that's explicitly what I'm going to get here. Okay? And um, so in the first case where I'm doing this random walk, I'm actually always at a single state. I know this is the expected, this is the distribution of, of where I'm going to be. So that means that that single state I drew after enough random walks is going to be a draw from a probability distribution described by Q star. And so there's this special way, and this is what the Metropolis algorithm will do. It'll set up, so there's some probability distribution I want to draw a random sample from. And then I do this random walk, and I just take the result of the random walk, and that gives me a sample when otherwise I wouldn't know how to draw a random sample. So we've seen, I think you've seen a few things in this class where a random sample is a really powerful tool. In statistics, especially Bayesian statistics, this is kind of the backbone of everything they're doing. They set it up so this Q star distribution is, is an, something they want to understand, and they randomly walk and then return the state. So that's one interpretation. The other is kind of, the other use of this is that it's kind of telling you the, the um, the importance of, of, the, of the vertices. And so this is where PageRank will come in. So we'll see this more on Wednesday. But what's happening here is that if, you, if you're randomly walking around and you tend to be in one of the states more than the other states, that's somehow more important. That's more central. If you have a graph where there's stuff on the fringes and you hardly ever go over there, um, then that's somehow not important as something in the middle of the graph, right? So um, this is kind of telling you about the importance of parts of the graph. And what you do with that is kind of a, it's kind of a um, you know, th th that's kind of a modeling choice, right? But, um, yeah, so, um, so th there's a couple other points I want to make here. So we'll see two of these in more detail. This one... I'll briefly talk about, and then, which is Metropolis. Second one we'll see in PageRank, but there are other uses of this as well. So I've I've seen people get kind of popular press about some algorithm because they ran a Markov chain. They says we're doing PageRank on the body, right? <laughs> they're they're running some Markov chain process on simulating blood flow or something, and they called it PageRank, and then it was in the New York Times, right? So um, so, so, uh, so the the power of buzzwords. Um, Okay, so a um, couple of other, other properties. One is that if I have this state that, that for any initial state Q times P star equals Q star, then that means that um, Q star equals P, P star times Q, right? So if I'm in... That means that if I'm in, so this P star means I've taken it to the limit, right? So if I took it to any initial state, I made one more step, multiplied by another matrix here, P, then I'm still going to be in this initial state because this matrix is still P star. We're doing these playing tricks with the limit here, right? Which means that um, Q star equals P star um, Q star, okay, well, th this, this is kind of obvious, right? Because any initial state gives us this. But it also, more interestingly, means we can also take this part. This was also Q star. So Q star equals P times Q star, right? So if I'm in this initial state, I multiply by this vector, I get back to this initial state. I mean, this, this, this converged to state. So if I'm in the converged to state, I do a random walk, I stay in the same state. Okay, this has two consequences. One is that Q star 
is an um, bleh, is an eigen vector of p. So it's so if you remember eigen vector, it's that it's a, it's a vector where you multiply it by the matrix and you get back the vector. And it's usually there's some scaling involved, right? But in this case, there's no scaling, and that's because we normalize the matrix P. Right? This normalization where we made all the columns have it be a probability distribution, it meant that there was no scaling, so we got it back exactly here. Right? And so it's an eigenvector of P. So that means one way, one of the consequences is one way to calculate Q star is not to do this, this funny business of running this to infinity, but to do the eigen decomposition of P. Right? You, you're going you're gonna to get Q star as one of the vectors. Which, which vector do you think it is? No, so it turns out the first one is going to be uninteresting. With It's eigenvectors. It's, it's, it's the second one. So, yeah, uh, or it's the last one or it's something like that. But, um, but yeah, it's, so the, it's the, it turns out this is the second eigenvector. Uh, and this... You know, this, I, I mentioned before, the second eigenvector was also related to spectral clustering. Um, in some way, the first one was, again, kind of, kind of useless. Um, the second one told you how to draw the graph out nicely. In this case, the second eigenvalue, right, so the first eigenvalue, um, so the, the, the first eigenvalue was going to be equals to, you normalize it so that one's equal to 1. And then you, if you normalize, and then you look at the at the second um, eigenvalue. So this is going to be um, less than one. Um, if it's if it's ergodic, it's going to be it's going to be less than one. I think unless it's the complete graph, there's some weird. So maybe it's less than or equal to one. Um, but this second eigenvalue tells you how fast it converges, how many steps you need to take before um, Qn is close enough to Q star. The larger the second eigenvalue is, the closer it is to 1, the, few, the, the more steps you need to take. So you're, you're talking about, as you keep doing this, so, some of the entries are going to go to 0, right? What's going to happen is you're going to eventually converge to... Shoot, maybe I'm... Ah, uh, no, okay, so, so I, I, I screwed up. This is, you were right, actually, um, John, Jonathan, it was the first eigenvector. Um, the second eigenvalue is what's interesting. Okay, sorry, so the, the first eigenvector, so this is the first eigenvector, because, yeah, and the, why you can see that is because it has this property where it, it equals itself. The second eigenvector will be less, eigenvalue will be less than one. And basically, you're, you're kind of converging to this first eigenvector by repeatedly doing this. And this is related to the power method for computing the SVD and other stuff. Um, but you're, what you're doing is you're driving down the effects of the second and the third eigenvectors. As you repeat it, they, they go down um, faster the smaller that second eigenvalue is. And you want to drive the second eigenvalue down to zero by repeatedly applying it. Um, so the smaller it is, the faster it goes to zero, the faster it converges. And so there's this very nice formal like, um, um, relation about this. And this has to do with what's called the, the mixing um, of Markov chains. So the mixing time is how long it takes to mix until you're basically approximately close to the right state. And this comes up in a lot of these randomized algorithms where you need this is the only way to draw a random sample, is the only way to estimate something is to run a Markov chain, and you want to know how long do you have to run it. And you have to estimate the second eigenvalue and tell says how far does this go down. Um, so in this example we did at the beginning, I think the eigen, second eigenvalue was like 0.85. And, and that's actually far enough away from 1 that if you run this like 10 steps, then that second eigenvalue is going to be like, um, after 10 steps, then um, say 0.85 to the power 10 what is this? This is going to be probably about something like point, probably less than point 0.1, right? Probably much less than point 0.1, right? So it's going to drive down really quickly. 
So, so, so 0.85 is a pretty low value for the second eigenvalue. That means it's going to mix pretty quick. If you get something like 0.99, then that's going to be bad. And that's going to kind of correspond with these, uh, the example, that transient example, kind of where you had this leaking that happened like one out of 100 times. You can draw, so it goes back and forth between two sets, but only one out of 100 times. And that's going to be a really slow convergence. Um, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so, so then there's this other property that you get out of this. Let me make some space here. Um, this, this second thing that you get out of this property here, where it's, it's not just that it's an eigenvector, but that um, but you, you get what's called the delicate um, um, balance. So that means that... Um, If I write this correctly, so if you are at, so it's going to mean that uh, I won't I won't try and write out the math of this, but the probability of being in a state J, so um, let's say the probability of um, being in J and then going to I is going to be equal to the probability of being in I and going to J. Okay? So if if I'm so 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 I know I'm in some in the converge to state, I have some probability of being in state J. Okay, so let's think of this like like the like the um, like on the web. I'm on on like the CNN homepage and um, I'm gonna have, if the probability I'm on the CNN homepage times the probability I click a link to an ad for like uh, Best Buy or someplace is, 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 is going to be, turns out is going to be equal to the probability that I'm currently looking at the Best Buy website that the ad took me to and I go to CNN, whether I type that in or not. Right? Maybe I have to type it in, maybe I have to click on something. But this is going to balance out. So the and in the converge to state you get this property. Okay, so if you have so um, so so if you're thinking, well, the web graph doesn't so let's see the probably beans. Oh yeah, so so this is uh, so you can think of this as being in K, in state. You can think of going from any state Q star through P star to get to Q star, but only it also happens going through P as well, which is what's kind of kind of strange here. So this is sometimes useful if you want to understand these properties. If you can show that this is always true, then you know you're in the converged to state. Um, so if you're in the web graph, you wouldn't, you probably wouldn't click from Best Buy to go to CNN, but you'd probably, you probably, you might just type in CNN because you like to browse there, or it's on your favorites bar, so you go there, right? But if the probability was high to going to Best Buy from CNN, then it's also, then it, you need to have a high probability of being in CNN by just going there randomly anyways. And so this is a good kind of concept to think, keep in mind. There are other case where maybe this makes more sense, but. Okay, so, so you get all these nice properties, right? So this Q star state is going to be kind of very, a very useful kind of object of the graph. Okay, um, so hopefully this kind of, so, so hopefully this makes sense. So now I'm gonna go through, we're gonna go through two examples. One will be page rank extended on Wednesday and I want to talk a little bit about the Metropolis algorithm. Um, so th this was invented by um, five authors. Um, first author's name was Metropolis, and that's where the name comes from. And the other two were like, uh, um, there are two husband and wife pairs, uh, Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, Teller, and Teller. And so this was, but it's just named after Metropolis. Um, I guess his name was cooler and earlier in the alphabet. Um, but this was like invented during as part of the Manhattan Project 
when they were trying to understand how to build the atomic bomb. And they had these really complicated probabilities they were trying to simulate, or they're trying to calculate. They didn't know how to calculate them. Um, and so they figured, well, there are computers coming online. Can we simulate them? And this was kind of the algorithm that, that, that came out. Um, and so the, the idea is we want to somehow set up, well, we want to set up so um, Q star is, is, an, um, is a like desired um, um, probability distribution. Right? I want this Q star to be something that I want to understand. So I need to, if I can set up a Markov chain so that it has this Q star, then I can draw random samples from it. And then I just draw random samples and I use those to kind of understand Q star. Even though I don't know how to do it, I just need to know like this delicate balance property or some Markov chain, which I know converges to that. Okay, and so, and so this kind of works where you have a series of states, um, V, um, and this states, um, these um, could be um, actually, um, they could be infinite. Okay, could, you could have an infinite set of states. Right, so think of this like, these are the Euclidean values and you want to draw from the, from the Gaussian distribution, right? You have an infinite values. This is the probability distribution you want to understand. Right, so this Q star is any probability distribution and it could be infinite. Okay, but let's just describe it with the finite case. And so it, it could also be that it's just really, really large, right? It's like all IP addresses. I can describe them with just the bits, but I can't write them all down, right? That takes too large. And what you can do is you can, you can um, only um, calculate some weight um, for, so for any state, I can calculate some weight associated with it. Okay, and so then I can define, and I'll write this in the general form as, as an integral um, over, over V and V of these weights V. So this is essentially just the sum of all the weights. This is an uppercase W here. And so then what I know is Q star of V is going to be equal to the weight of V over uppercase W. Okay, so I can calculate this weight, but I don't know how to normalize it. In order to get Q star, I need to normalize it. Okay, so this weight is, is in, in these probability and statistics, <laughs> this is a um, likelihood. So I can define a likelihood of a function, of a, of a, of a configuration, but I don't, know the, I don't know how to calculate this integral. So I can't normalize it to know the probability distribution. So I can't, so I can define a likelihood, but I can't define the probability distribution because I can't normalize. Okay, so this is really hard to calculate. Um, so, but if I know this, this weight, I can set up a Markov chain so that Q star is, is the converged to state. Okay? So, so um, and so how I do this is a fairly simple algorithm. Um, let me try and define it in the last couple minutes here. So I'm, I'm going to, so again, this is, so, 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 um, so I, I need to initialize um, some initial Q as somewhere where I'm at a one. And this is again, this random walk property where I'm always going to be in exactly one state. So I start with some initial condition. It doesn't matter so much what it is. Um, and so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a, a new state, which is in the somehow in the neighborhood um, of, of my initial state Q. Okay? So this neighborhood is, can be defined in various ways. It could be that this is equal to drawing from some normal distribution centered at Q with some standard deviation. So if it's a continuous state space, I can draw from a normal distribution around it. So something nearby. In, in a graph, I draw one of the neighbors, okay? Um, right, but you often don't have the graph explicit, explicitly. Um, what, what you have is the weight, so I need to use the weights. So now I say if the weight 
of u is greater or equal to the weight of q, then I set, so this is say q0, and so then for, um, this is say qi, <clears throat> then I'm going to set um, qi plus 1 equals to u. So this is a proposed new state. If the weight is larger, I always ch choose my next state to be this. Um, else, with, with probability, um, so, so if in the other case, that means Q, uh, the weight of U is smaller than the weight of QI. So then with probability, weight of U divided by weight of QI. So, th so this is something less than 1. With this probability, I still set equals to U. So I still use this as my next state. Um, so otherwise, I set QI um, plus 1 equals to QI. So I stay in the same spot. All right, so I, I make a proposal of, in the neighborhood of a new state. And if the probability is higher, I always make it. If it's lower, I make it with some probability. And if I don't make that state, I stay where I am. Okay? So in, in this, is, this is the algorithm. So, so this is the random walk. So if you do this random walk using this algorithm defines the random walk now on this, it can be a continuous state space. So, so I'm, I'm running out of time here, but you kind of, this gives you one's, one random sample, one um, random sample here. Typically I want a bunch of random samples to estimate a distribution. So basically what you do is you run for a burn-in period of like a thousand steps and usually they use a thousand in almost any context for whatever reason. Um, you do a thousand random steps and then they take like the next 5,000 as a random sample. That's technically not mathematically right. Um, you should, there's this autocorrelation because sometimes you pick a state twice. So technically you should run it for like um, an infinite number of steps, take one and then start over again. Um, because the next one is correlated with the previous one. Um, but that's typically how you do. You run for a burn-in period of 1,000, and then the, you then take the next 5,000. Okay, and so this is the Metropolis algorithm. This is a really powerful thing. It's related to this um, Gibbs sampling. This is a, Gibbs sampling is a special case of this used in Bayesian statistics all the time. Okay, great. So uh, we'll talk about PageRank on Wednesday and the kind of the history of search engines as well.